Liqueurs are the sweet side of spirits. They're closely related to flavored spirits, but they meet a required minimum sugar level. Now, depending on the type of liqueur, the sugar content might be as high as 40%. You may have heard the term liqueur and cordial. Is there a difference between the two? Actually, no. Historically, cordials were sweet spirits that were fruit-based, and liqueurs were spirits that were herb-based. But the line now is blurred, and these days the words are used interchangeably. People in the United States tend to use the word cordials, while Europeans use liqueurs. But whether you call them cordials or liqueurs, you won't see a wider range of colors and flavors in any other category. Why? Because liqueurs can be made from anything. Fruits, herbs, spices, seeds, nuts, cream, coffee, you name it. For today's lecture, you'll need the following to taste with us. Amaretto, Drambuie, Cointreau, a generic triple sec. I know that Cointreau and triple sec are both orange flavored liqueurs, but I want you to get both. Grand Marnier, Absinthe or Absinthe, these aren't exactly the same, but they're closely related. And chartreuse or other herbal liqueur. In this lecture, we will make some cocktails with Josh Berner, mixologist at Ripple. If you want to make these with us, make sure you get the list of ingredients from your guidebook. Our cocktails are the Cosmopolitan, Monkey's Gland, and a B-52, which is one of those crazy layered drinks. Today, we think of liqueurs as an after-dinner drink, kind of a dessert. But in the Middle Ages, monks and others would steep herbs in alcohol to produce medicines in the hope of warding off bubonic plague. Remember that Mary Poppins song, A Spoonful of Sugar Helps the Medicine Go Down? That was the general idea with those herb-infused alcohol medicines, and that's where liqueurs came from. Some of the liqueurs created by these monks are still in production today and are named after the orders that created them. For example, Benedictine is made by the monks of the same name in France. And Chartreuse is made by the Cartesian monks, also in France, who developed this liqueur in the hopes of creating an elixir for long life. The Italians have been making liqueurs and bitters for centuries. Some of the most popular liqueurs even today are Italian. For example, Amaretto, Amaro, which means bitter, and Sambuca, just to name a few. I'll talk about bitters a little later in the lecture, but let's start by looking at the base spirits of liqueurs. Liqueurs come in all kinds of flavors, from artichoke to melon to hazelnut. Theoretically, you could add any flavoring in sugar to any spirit and make it a liqueur, but it's not necessarily one you want to drink. So what goes into making a good liqueur? The distiller chooses ingredients and processing based on desired flavor, availability of flavoring materials, and of course, economic considerations. Let's look at flavor first. As we've seen in other lectures, the base spirit has an impact on the final flavor. So the first decision the distiller must make is which base to start with. For example, for a fruit-based liqueur, the distiller may want to choose an eau de vie or a brandy base distilled from fermented fruits. Here I have two liqueurs, amaretto and drambouille two popular liqueurs with two different bases. Before you taste, know that you don't have to sip them straight. I do when tasting comparing, but um, because I prefer to get the full flavor of the spirit. But if you want to add ice or some water, that's okay. You'll still get the effect of what we're talking about here. So let's start with the Di Sorono Originale Amaretto. Notice when you're looking between these two spirits, look at the reddish hue you're getting with the amaretto. Now you sniff. The base spirit is made from apricots and the flavor you think is almonds actually comes from the herbs and spices that are macerated in the apricot kernel oil. This is a recipe that dates back to 1525. Now let's take a sip. It's a liqueur. Amaretto is sweet. It's about 28% alcohol by volume, and you can tell that the base is fruity. Now let's try the Drambouille. See, it has a gold or pale amber kind of color. Now let's sniff. You definitely get some honey, some herbs, like heather, and some spices like clove and nutmeg, but you can definitely tell it's based on whiskey. 
Now let's take a sip. Drambu is also sweet. It's about 40% alcohol by volume, and you can tell that the base is whiskey. As we've just seen, the base spirit is the first thing that can influence the flavor in a liqueur. This is important because the flavors that are added to the base should be complementary. For example, with cream liqueurs, you'd want a base that is totally neutral, such as vodka or whiskey, because that, that would prevent any strange flavor interactions. However, financial considerations also come into play in making liqueurs. Using cognac as the base, as in Grand Marnier, is expensive, and a distiller may prefer to save money by using a beet sugar or wheat or corn vodka base. In addition to the flavor, the base spirit also affects the final price of the liqueur. Once a distiller decides on the base spirit, flavor is then added. The goal is to extract the most intense flavors and aromas from the flavoring agents. There are several methods of extraction, and each has its benefits and disadvantages. The cheapest method is compounding. This is a simple process of blending in essences and concentrates in, into a base spirit. These can be natural essences or artificial flavorings. Maceration is the process that is most gentle on the flavoring material, so it's generally reserved for those flavoring agents that will change flavor or structure with heat, such as delicate fruits, like berries or bananas. These are soaked in high-proof alcohol until their character is absorbed by the alcohol. Heat is not used with maceration. Infusion is a type of maceration that does use heat. It's usually reserved for dried leaves, plants, herbs, and so on. It's the same concept as steeping a tea bag in hot water. Sometimes this process is also called digestion. Percolation is another flavor extraction method that uses heat. The spirit is put in the bottom of a tank and pumped through the flavoring agents, which are at the top. They do this over and over again. This is the same concept as using a percolator to make coffee. This method is a bit more aggressive on the flavoring agents, and um, it's especially used for those that are tough to extract from their sources, such as vanilla or cocoa beans or some other types of botanicals. The final extraction method is distillation. This process is similar to what we saw in the production of gin. Botanicals are dried and placed in a pot still. Base spirit is added to the still and then boiled. The vapor rises up as it's heated and it's, it carries those molecules from the base spirit and the essential oil compounds from the botanicals. This is the most expensive and labor-intensive process and is reserved for rinds, flowers, and, and even more flavorful botanicals. What difference does the type of flavor addition make? Here I have Cointreau and Triple Sec. The first name is proprietary and the second is generic. Cointreau was the first in orange liqueurs to double distill and was said to be three times drier than the others. Triple sec, or three dry in French, refers to the property of being three times drier. Cointreau is a proprietary liqueur because it's made from an exclusive recipe that only Cointreau knows. I've been to the distillery where visitors are told that they use dried orange peels from sweet and bitter oranges, but beyond that, you're not told anything. Cointreau may have invented the triple sec category back in the 1800s, but since then, other producers have wanted to get on the action. These producers make a generic version of triple sec. A generic brand has no proprietary name, which has commoditized some of these liqueurs. Some generic brands of triple sec are made using a single flavoring agent. So let's compare the Cointreau and generic triple sec side by side. Taking a look at them, they look very clear, like water. Now let's smell them. Sniffing the Cointreau, you smell fresh and dried orange peels, and it smells like a, you have a little bit of floral notes in there. Now let's smell the triple sec. The triple sec also smells like orange flavor, but it, instead of smelling like a fresh and dried orange peels, it smells more like um, orange flavored gum or orange soda. Now, I don't have anything against gum or soda. My point here is that one smells more candied and artificial smelling than the other. Now let's sip. Tasting the Cointreau, 
you definitely get that it's you, it has some sweetness to it. And and you definitely taste the alcohol in there as well. And you have some of the same flavors that you got on the palate as you got on the nose. So it's fresh and dried orange peels and you know just a little hint of floral notes. Now let's try the triple sec. Same flavors as you got on the nose, but on the palate it seems to be a bit sweeter and lower than alcohol. Remember we were talking about what triple sec means, that triple, triple sec is uh, three times as dry? Well, um, in this case, the triple sec here is actually sweeter than the Cointreau. Notice how long the flavor lasts as well. The flavor of the Cointreau lasts longer than the triple sec, and the triple sec seems fairly one-dimensional, meaning that it has just one flavor, while Cointreau has a couple of layers to it. I mean, you could smell other things such as orange peels and, and light floral tones as well, so you may get that. Now, I'm not suggesting that generic brands are all artificial and proprietary brands are all natural. The point is that knowing the production methods in advance can make all the difference in your tasting experience and in your cocktails. In terms of taste, you may prefer Cointreau in your cocktails, given that it has a bit more complexity and longer length and a, a bit more of a natural kind of aroma. But because it's less expensive, however, some hosts or bartenders prefer to use triple sack. Still, great bartenders and certainly mixologists prefer to use spirits that are of the best quality and made with the freshest ingredients. They know that these factors affect the resulting cocktail. Here's another fun demo you can try. Take two cocktail glasses and put some water in them, about halfway up or so. Of course, they're both clear. They're water. Now pour some triple sec in one glass and Cointreau into the other and see what happens. Do you notice something? The Cointreau starts to cloud up, looking like someone's added milk in there, and it actually looks kind of opalescent. Some producers call this an opalescence, but what's going on? This is a reaction called louching. The reason that the glass with the Cointreau goes cloudy has to do with the natural oils in the product. When these hydrophobic essential oils mix with water, an oil and water microemulsion reaction takes place. That's why you see the cloudiness. Notice that this reaction doesn't take place in the other glass. So what does that tell you? It tells you that the generic triple sec does not have as much natural essential oils. I was in a restaurant a few years back and I ordered a cocktail that was listed as containing Cointreau. But when I tasted it, it tasted kind of like orange flavored bubblegum. I asked the bartender to pour me an old fashioned glass of the Cointreau and put ice in it and a little water. It didn't cloud up, so I knew that the restaurant was pouring generic triple sec into the Cointreau bottle and trying to pass it off as the good stuff. Now, before we move on from these two similar liqueurs, let's up the ante a little bit by going to another type of liqueur, Grand Marnier. You might say it's just another orange flavored spirit, but is it? It's not. The base of the Grand Marnier is cognac, and this is where you can really see the difference that the base spirit makes. The makers of Grand Marnier use only the peels of bitter oranges from Haiti, so the flavorings are also make a difference. The Grand Marnier definitely has different sets of flavors and different complexities. So let's compare these two proprietary spirits. Well, you take a look. They're both very different colors. One is clear and the other one is slightly tawny. Now let's sniff. Again, we smelled the Quattro before and the same. You've got the fresh and dried orange peel notes in there and a little floral notes. And now let's sniff the Grand Marnier. You get some slightly toasty aromas in there and it almost smells like um, more of those dried orange peels and little hints of vanilla. Now let's taste. They're both sweet, but you definitely notice those um, kind of touches that, you, that yeah, it's kind of those touches that they've seen oak, like the vanilla kind of to tones in there and some kind of caramelly kind of notes. So it's a little different. So it's less fruity, 
but you have other layers of complexity in there. Now, go back to the triple sec and have a sip. You should really notice the difference there. You might be more inclined to use the triple sec or Cointreau to mix in, in a cocktail and to sip the Grand Marnier, although it does add a sublime flavor to a cocktail. We talked earlier about chartreuse, which is an herbal liqueur. Legend has it that the original recipe included 130 different herbs, flowers, and spices. Let's subject it to our four S's. C. Take note of the color. Chartreuse has a unique color. The color you see here is the original chartreuse, came from the chlorophyll of the, the plants and herbs used for the flavoring. So it is green, while yellow chartreuse is colored with saffron. Now sniff. When you sniff, you may notice aromas of citrus, cloves, cinnamon, thyme, and rosemary. It smells like herbs. Now take a sip. Chartreuse is pretty high in alcohol, about 55% ABV or 110 proof. This will feel, um, you'll feel a lot of heat on the back palate. Now savor. The intensity of the flavor that lasts for a long time on the palate is what you'll notice with chartreuse. Do you notice a bit of bitterness towards the finish? That's typical too. These elements can add structure to cocktails. Absinthe is probably the most infamous liqueur. People still think that it's illegal or that it causes hallucinations. And there are a lot of myths out there about absinthe, but here's the real story. Absinthe is a liqueur with wormwood as the flavoring agent. Wormwood is a plant that's related to anise, and though pure wormwood oil is poisonous, it was originally used in small doses for medicinal treatments. For example, it was once used to ease childbirth, to cure stomach aches, and as an antiseptic, among other things. But what does wormwood taste like? It has actually a musky floral aroma, and it's slightly bitter. In fact, bitterness is mentioned in the Bible. That's how ancient it is. Absinthe, the liqueur made with wormwood, had a very high level of alcohol, generally from 131 to 150 proof, or up to 75% alcohol by volume. And it was sweetened to overcome that same bitterness that it's been known for. In the late 1700s, absinthe was used by the French Foreign Legion to treat malaria. However, it began to have a more recreational reputation as people claimed it boosted creativity. In the late 1800s, absinthe was a popular drink among Parisian artists and bohemians. Some very famous people were known to be absinthe drinkers, such as Van Gogh and Oscar Wilde. The classic way to drink absinthe is with a lump of sugar. Here's how. You can use absinthe or absinthe for this. Absinthe uses a different type of wormwood called southwood, and it's a bit sweeter, so use only one lump of sugar. And by the way, you have to use a lump or a cube of sugar, not a spoonful. Now, what you want to do is place two ounces in a tumbler. That's one. That's two. And then what you want to do is place one large ice cube in there. Or if you have smaller ones, two. Then what you want to do is put a sugar cube on an absinthe spoon and you want to put it on the flat side of the spoon where you have the holes. It just rests right on top of the glass like, like that. Then you're going to drip water on top of the sugar cube. This is going to start the melting process. The melted sugar will sweeten the absinthe and then you, you can feel free to taste it. By the end of the 19th century, absinthe had a reputation for being an addictive, psychoactive drug, just like opium. But that was a myth. I mean, believe me, I wouldn't tell you if it wasn't true. The cause for all of the commotion is a dangerous chemical in wormwood called thujone. In high do doses, thujone affects the nervous system and creates convulsions. Scientists in the past, though, said that absinthe contained up to 260 to 350 milligrams per liter of thujone, and that's why it was banned. But a study in 2008 showed that the absinthe produced from around that time 
only had about 25 milligrams of thujone per liter. And for that reason, absinthe is now legal. It can be produced under the European Union limits for thujone content, which is about a maximum of 10 milligrams per liter. If greater than 25% alcohol, then it's illegal. Look for these terms on liqueur bottles to help you determine quality. Ordinaire, ordinary in French, refers to those liqueurs at the bottom of the value spectrum. Demi-fine is the next level up. Fine is higher than demi-fine. And surfine means top quality. Then there are three sweetness levels. Bomb has a thick consistency. Liqueurs labeled water extract or elixir are on the lighter side. Creme indicates that a single flavoring agent has been used and the liqueur is usually heavily sugared. These liqueurs such as creme de coco or creme de cassis are rich and extra sweet. Don't confuse the word creme with cream such as in Bailey's Irish cream which actually have cream in them. In 1979, Bailey's Irish Cream opened the door for cream liqueurs when it produced, its producers figured out how to develop a blend that could last at room temperature indefinitely or in a refrigerator for about two months after it's been opened. The category of spirits known as bitters can be confusing. Bitters are used not only as aperitifs and digestifs, meaning to help digest your meal, but also as structural elements to add some magic to cocktails. Bitters have been used as medicine since the days of Hippocrates around the 5th century BC, and the Romans used them as well. They're made in the same way as other liqueurs, that is, certain natural botanicals or other ingredients are distilled or macerated in neutral alcohol to concentrate the bitter compounds. For centuries, the bark of the cinchona tree had been a key ingredient in bitters because it contains quinine. You've heard of tonic water. That has a tiny bit of quinine in it. Quinine has been used to treat a host of ailments, including malaria, and the Peruvians used to take it to stop the shivering from the bitter cold in the Andes. Today, cinchon is used along with angelica root, bitter orange, rue, artichokes, rhubarb, bitter aloe, and other roots and botanicals to make bitters. Sweetener is added to reduce that level of bitterness, that intensity. There are three types of bitters, aperitif bitters, digestif bitters, and cocktail bitters. Aperitifs are those bitters that are, are drunk, before a meal to sharpen that appetite. Campari is an example of this type of, of bitters. Campari is an Italian brand with 68 ingredients, including bitter orange, rhubarb, and cinchon. Then there are digestifs, which are consumed after a meal. Digestif bitters fall into two camps, sweet and overtly bitter. The Italian Amaro Averna is the sweet camp. By contrast, if you've ever been to the Czech Republic, you may know Bekrovka, which is quite herbal or medicinal tasting. Jägermeister, which is popular with college students, is an example of a digestif in the overtly bitter camp. It has 56 ingredients, including anise, poppy seed, and juniper. Finally, we have cocktail bitters, which are reduced to their essence and have a unique ability to add amazing flavor to drinks. Angostura bitters is one of the most popular brands of cocktail bitters, and like many liqueurs and bitters, it, it got its start as a medicine. It was first made in 1824 by Dr. Johann Seigert to treat malaria for troops in Venezuela, and was also used for things like hiccups, upset stomach, seasickness, and scurvy. You may have heard that Angostura bitters is poisonous because it contains Angostura bark, but this is a myth. However, in the old days, there were crooked sellers who would adulterate the bitters with cheaper and actually poisonous barks. Angostura bitters, often just known as Angostura, has about 44.7% ABV and is flavored with gentian root and vegetable extracts. Mai Tais, Planter's Punch, and Between the Sheets are just a few drinks that can be made without bitters but, can, but gain complexity and flavor when bitters are added. You should experiment a little bit when you, you have cocktails so you can see the difference between the two and what bitters can do for your cocktails. Some cocktails languish in the sidelines until someone famous starts drinking them. The Cosmo first came on the scene in the 1980s and a lot of places claimed to invent it. A decade later, Madonna was spotted drinking one and the Cosmo became an overnight success. 
our mixologist, Josh Berner, is going to make us a classic cosmopolitan, and then he's going to make a drink that will give you a chance to try absinthe. It's called a monkey's gland. I know it sounds horrible, but it's really amazing if you try one, so pay attention to the long finish that the absinthe gives to the drink. Josh will also make a B-52, which gives you a final challenge if you want to try making a layering drink at home. Hi everyone, today we're making that very popular drink, the Cosmopolitan. So the first ingredient is one and a half ounces of the citron vodka. And you can use regular vodka too. I prefer to use the citrus just because I think it gives it more of a complex flavor. Next is one ounce of Cointreau, the orange liqueur. And then one quarter ounce each of fresh squeezed lime juice. I squeezed mine ahead of time. And cranberry juice. Add some ice to your shaker. And then shake really hard. I'm shaking hard because I want to really wake up all those good ingredients in the drink. Then you just pour out the ice and replace it with the Cosmopolitan. Strain it out and finish it off with a beautiful lime wedge. And that's the Cosmopolitan. Okay, here's how you make a monkey gland cocktail. This is a drink that cocktail aficionados will know, but not a lot of other people have heard of it, but it's a big hit. First, you're gonna add ice to your shaker, and you're gonna use four key ingredients here. First is gin, absinthe, then grenadine, and fresh squeezed orange juice. So the first thing is to add two ounces of gin, I'm using an American style gin called Voyager. It's made in Washington state and it's a little more citrusy and a little less heavy on the juniper than some London style dry gins. Uh, so it gives it the cocktail a nice lighter citrus flavor. Next is grenadine. Now I make my own. It's essentially a pomegranate syrup, but you can use a store bought if you want. Then one ounce of fresh squeezed orange juice. I've done mine ahead of time, but you can squeeze it per drink if you want. And shake it up. Next is the key. You're going to swirl the inside of your glass with a little bit of absinthe. Now absinthe is just going to give this drink a nice scent of anise. And you don't want a lot because it is very, can be overpowering. We just want to swirl it around the glass and then dump it out. Strain in your cocktail. And finish it with an orange twist. Now when you're making a twist, you can either use a channel knife like I am, or you can just cut a little slice of orange being careful not to get any of the pith. You don't want any of the white part of the rind because that's going to be very bitter. And you do want to get all of the oils. The idea is to get the oils from the orange into your drink. So you want to squeeze it over the drink and rub the rind around the rim a little bit to get some of the oils in there and then drop it in. And that's the monkey gland. Now we're going to make a fun, really cool looking drink called a B-52. Now the trick to this drink is a technique called layering. You're going to use three ingredients. First is Kahlua, then Bailey's Irish Cream, and finally Grand Marnier. Now normally I would use a jigger. You want to always measure everything that goes into your drink so you get the proportions right. But you'll find if you use a jigger, it's very hard to pour in this technique. So instead I'm using a measuring cup. Something with a spout is the most important part. First, one ounce of Kahlua, and you're gonna use equal parts of each of the ingredients for this cocktail. 
And the order is very important because the way that layering works is through the different densities of each of the alcohols. Next is the Baileys. The other key to this is having a spoon and you're gonna turn the spoon over, put it at the very side of the glass and then pour the Baileys over the back of the spoon very slowly. What that does is it slows down the alcohol when you're pouring it in so that it doesn't splash around and mix and it also disperses it so that it goes over an even area. The last ingredient of course is the Grand Marnier, essentially an orange flavored cognac. And again, the back of the spoon, I'm pouring very slowly so that the Grand Marnier just sits right on top of your Baileys. And if you do it right, and it may take you a couple of tries to get it, you'll have three very distinct layers. The dark brown of the Kahlua, the light creaminess of the Baileys, and then the almost clear Grand Marnier on top. And then that's the B-52. And that's it. We've covered all of the spirit categories. Vodka, gin, whiskey, rum, tequila, brandy, and liqueurs. You are now armed with the knowledge of how they taste, have some great insight into their histories, and know how to make some great classic cocktails and a few wild ones. This course comes with two bonus lectures. These will teach you the importance of ice, how to use bartender tools, how to make your cocktails look even better, and how to make your cocktails more figure-friendly, and making holiday cocktails and more. If you've made it this far in the course, you deserve to relax and have a drink. So, cheers. <laughs>